In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You got anything to eat? You got anything to eat? Jesus has just suffered one of the most painful and difficult deaths imaginable. He's been buried for a couple days, and now he's resurrected and he's with his friends, and the one thing he wants to ask them is, you got anything to eat? The central event of Christian faith, the event around which countless millions would build and nurture their faith in God has just occurred, and this question about food comes about and is asked by the central figure of the story. Is this how you and I live out our most significant events of our lives? Congratulations, Mr. Holland, you have a beautiful boy. That's awesome. You got anything to eat? Or, good morning, Father Holland. The Holy Father would like a meeting with you in 20 minutes. Great. You got any sandwiches? <laughs> really? Do you have anything to eat? Jesus has been raised from the dead. The Spirit of God has been unleashed upon an unsuspecting world. The reign of God is spreading like dandelions on the rectory lawn. And that is the question at hand. His question reminds me of raising my three boys. No matter what time it was, early morning, late evening, before school, after school, bedtime, halfway through bedtime, the question was the same. Hey, Dad, what is there to eat? As I thought about this reading, it occurred to me that it's not that you and I are lacking in food, as our bikinis are telling us as we're warming up to go outside to the beaches. I know you're all on the same page with that that I am. We do have plenty to eat, but we don't always take the time maybe to share that food with others in a quality kind of a way. Families have become so busy that they don't always eat at the same table or at the same time. Maybe mom works late, uh, late some nights, and so no one else knows how to work the mysterious buttons on the stove, so they wait or they snack. Maybe the kids have baseball practice until 9 p.m., and then it's really too late to have a full-scale meal. And maybe dad has some church responsibilities and some meetings. So you can see how the planning of family meal time gets moved around or canceled entirely. You and I know all kinds of people who would be more than happy to share a meal with somebody. Widowers and widows, older adults, the mentally ill who live alone, many single people who know how it is to sit down to eat. They got that figured out. They know how to work the magic buttons on the stove. But they'd rather not maybe sit and stay at home and eat alone. And so many of them head to the restaurants and buffets. And maybe they are feeling that life is missing a little something at mealtime, like it's a little emptier than it should be. Relationships happen at mealtime. And for those of us like myself who hates to eat out in public alone, I feel like the whole world is watching me thinking, oh, that poor homeless man has no friends. Why doesn't he do something with that hair? Doesn't he have a comb? Right? You know, you know that feeling. It's not that I h hate the eating part. I hate the, that perception that there's nobody with whom I am in a relationship. Something happens, something powerful happens when we sit down to table with somebody else face to face, sharing our stories and our laughter and our food. Well, I'm not so big on sharing my food, but those of you who are, Gail can attest to this, right? 
You want it, you should have ordered it. <laughs> Regardless, the experience is enriching. We feel blessed in some significant ways because we have shared a simple meal with somebody else. It doesn't need to be something at Eddie Merlot's. It can be something at Dairy Queen, right? It's not about the food. The Christmas after my house burned in 1992, I was finally putting our lives back together when my pastor, a Ukrainian priest, invited all of us to the rectory for Christmas Eve dinner. And since I didn't have any family in town or even in state, and I was going to be singing that Christmas Eve midnight mass anyway, I accepted the invitation. And so he and his wife, he was a Byzantine priest, they can get married, um, they followed the Ukrainian holiday custom of serving 12 different courses of food, one for each of the apostles, and not one of them could contain meat or dairy products of any kind. It sounds like a meal to skip, but in fact, it was really very good. But I was amazed at the amount of work that Father and his family had done to prepare this vast and delicious meal that he and I, as a result of that shared meal, he and I developed a close relationship that lasted for many years. And I'm not so sure that we would have had that same relationship had we not shared that pivotal meal. Throughout the scriptures, Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures, the table, the idea of the table, is used a lot as an image for communication between persons, for the establishment and the maintaining of kinship ties. Think of the icon of the Trinity, Rublev's famous icon, the three angels. They're sitting at table. They're sharing the same bowl of food. The story in the icon is that even God, within God's mysterious self, there is community. Luke tells us several stories of Jesus eating some important meals with people. He eats with sinners and with prominent leaders alike. He eats in private residences and out in the open country. In one chapter, he feeds 5,000, and in the next, he's having a simple meal with Mary and Martha. If we look at each of those stories in the New Testament, we can see that most of the meals mentioned have Jesus eating in some rather intimate situations. Even when he feeds the 5,000, he has them sit down in smaller groups so that each person is surrounded by a more intimate circle of people. So there's power. There's power in the eating and in the sharing of food and in the coming together at table. And as I have found to my chagrin, it's impossible to remain angry or annoyed with someone when they're eating right across from you. You can't digest your food if you're mad. You have to let it go. And so the act of eating, the act of sharing table nurtures our bodies as well as our spirits. And that's why we gather to eat at funerals and weddings, to remind us, I think, that in all of life's circumstances, we are fed not so much by the food, but by the company and by the love of other people. Isn't this why we have those monthly potlucks here? I think it is. Wherever I have lived, I have always cooked for family and friends. And although I would have a very difficult time remembering all the food and drinks and crazy desserts that I have served up, I have no problem remembering the bonds that developed between the many people with whom I have shared food. This is the meaning of the Greek word koinonia community or fellowship. When we share the food at table together, 
we build the bonds. We create and nurture relationships. Now many of you, most of you, know that I was trained and worked for several years as a sous chef in many restaurants. I like good food. I like to cook. I like trying new things. Sometimes my meals have gotten overly complicated and stressful, as anybody who's been in the house at holiday time when I'm cooking can attest. This is the opposite <laughs> of how Jesus ate. I don't know why I don't get this at the time. I need to simplify. Jesus did not have any stress over mealtime, whether the napkins matched the tablecloth exactly, what forks were where, whose dishes were being used, none of that. The scriptures make it clear that Jesus ate very simply. Two fish, some bread maybe. Mary and Martha, two of his dear friends, would not have had the financial means to prepare extravagant meals with multiple courses, but even they knew that the focus was not going to be on the food. It's not about the food. It was going to be on the people at table with them. And so if we look around this city and this culture, I say this city because we were named right, uh, the largest city or something, weight-wise. We have a weight issue in Fort Wayne, apparently. So there are those of us with issues with eating, right, whether we eat too much or not enough or not the right things, and so our cholesterol is high. That's me. I'm in that category. Because we're thinking it's about the food, but it's not about the food. It's supposed to be about the people and the bonds created with the people. The same thing is true about all of our Holy Redeemer potlucks, if you think about it. Even though we have some darn fine food sometimes, and that ham bone, by the way, was picked surgically clean. <laughs> Soup cannot be made from that bone. That bone has to go to a science lab for a reconstruction of a pig because it is immaculate. Even though we have those good meals. We enjoy the food. It's really about the relationships that eating together brings. Even at communion time, we reverence the body and the blood of Christ, but we know that it's not the food that is the ultimate goal of our gathering. The important thing, the most important thing, is the fellowship, the communion of the communicators, those, are those of us who are here, we share our lives. We share this moment of communion to take that out of here to expand the circle. And in that process, you and I are transformed by the reality that we share this simple meal of bread and wine with Jesus and with those around us and with all those who have come before So when Jesus says, you got anything to eat? He's not talking about his own physical bodily needs. He doesn't have a body to worry about. He's been glorified. He is in his resurrected body. He doesn't need a biological, uh, there's no necessity from a biological sense there. But he wants to make absolutely certain that his disciples understand clearly that their deepest needs for communion with each other, for fellowship with others who share on this journey with them, that those needs are being met. And so today, like every Sunday, we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Mass, the Eucharist, whatever you want to call it, we celebrate the food that brings us together, the meal that binds our hearts and our lives together, the bread that sustains us body and soul. Our focus is on the bread and wine as the body and blood of Christ, to be sure. But more importantly, we focus on the acceptance that we find, the communion that we share with our God and with each other. 
and the reality that as we consume the sacred body and blood, we become Christ ourselves. Do you have anything to eat? Well, as a matter of fact, we do. And when we insist, as we do, that our table be open to all people, without any bias, without any walls or restrictions, without any barriers, then we are truly in communion with each other. We are really witnesses to the love of our God shared in the resurrected Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.